Hey everyone. Uh, Facebook Live has me blocked for some reason. Um, don't know why. Uh, usually the only thing I use live for is to do uh, the gospel type messages, uh, reading through the scriptures, things like that. So um, I, th I thought my friend list was clean enough where I don't have any of the uh, complainers, the people that will, uh, you know, report you because they're offended at something. Um, apparently I was wrong. Somebody on there uh, reported me and I, I was never notified by Facebook, so I don't know why they, they blocked me. Like I say, the only thing I read on there is uh, scriptures and, and teaching videos, so <clears throat> um, there's nothing that would have violated their community standards or whatever, so I don't know why I've been banned on there, but nonetheless, um, trying this little workaround here, just recording the video instead of going live, and then um, I'll post it to YouTube and then link it on, on Facebook, see if that works, but um, so it's uh, Sunday night doing another uh, teaching video here uh, this one I wrote in March of 2017 and it's uh, titled is faith a choice and so I think the idea behind this is is um, anybody who knows me knows I'm a Calvinist a lot of people are opposed to that that term um, <clears throat> you could call it the doctrines of grace you could call it tulip theology um, whatever you, you would have it's it's nothing that I determined hey I'm going to do this or I want to learn this um, I I had no idea about Calvinism or Arminianism or um, any any of the the teachers of the doctrines of grace I didn't know any of that because I wasn't raised in the church and when I got saved I avoided church because I was convinced it was full of false teachers um, so for like the first three years of my life my spiritual life um, it was just me and the scriptures and like I say, I didn't know anything I didn't know who John Calvin was I didn't know what reformed theology was I didn't even know what the word theology was I just I just studied the word and as I did I, I would see God's sovereignty over everything and specifically over salvation that that God chooses whom he will and hardens whom he will and that uh, that we're all equally condemned and that God chooses to have mercy on some of us. He enlightens our eyes and reveals the scriptures to us. And it matched my experience because I didn't do anything to earn salvation. There was no, there was no decision made. There was nothing I said, I, I'm going to try Christianity. I'm going to go down this path. That's not how salvation worked in, in my experience. What, what ha, you know, I wasn't looking for God. God came and found me in a miserable state when I was lost and doomed. I didn't know I was lost and doomed. I thought I was just living my life, getting high, getting drunk, having sex. You know, and I thought that's what life was about. I had no thoughts about God. I didn't desire God. I had no thoughts on church other than I, you know, I think I probably mocked at it in my heart, thought it was a waste of time, um, just for uh, a crutch for weak people. And, um, so like I said, I, I, there, there was no um, thought out process of, hey, I need God or, hey, I need to do this. It was just the Lord coming to me and, and opening my eyes and revealing to me the reality of things, that, that I was accountable for the things I was doing, that the evil in my life, I was going to have to give an account of the evil things I had done. Um, I, I was going to answer for them. There was no getting away with it. There was a creator, um, a God in the heavens who, who was aware of everything I was doing. And I was going to have to answer someday um, upon death. And I would have to give an account. And I, I knew I was doomed. I knew I was damned. I knew there was no hope for me. I was caught red-handed. What excuse can I make? Um, he knows all things. He had seen everything I had ever done, everything I had ever thought. And I was going to have to answer for that. And, um, and then he brought the gospel to me, a preacher to preach the gospel, to show me how Jesus Christ uh, suffered and died in my place. He took my punishment. The justice that I owed, that was due to me, the, the penalty that I owed when I died, that, 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 that accounting that I was going to have to give, somebody else had paid, Jesus Christ. And he offered salvation to me through faith in him. And um, so it was a miraculous gift where he enlightened my eyes, enlightened my heart, and caused me to be born again. 
And then I would read the scriptures and I would see that in the scriptures that God predestined, he foreordained, um, that, you know, in his time, he opens the eyes of his lost sheep. He'll lose none of his. He comes to save his people. Um, and he doesn't, he doesn't lose. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, a guarantee, you know, that if you're, if you're called by him, if you're his, he's going to save you. And that there's, there's being his is not because of anything we did because we were lost. We were damned. We couldn't do anything like we're in the same boat as everybody else. So, so there's no, there's no distinction between me and, and a person who doesn't get saved. There's no distinction. I, there's nothing in me that deserves it any more than them. In fact, they probably deserve it more um, because I know my own wretched heart, my own thoughts. I know how wicked I can be. And so um, that's what I would read in the scriptures. And, and, and I believed that, that God was sovereign over all things, over salvation. And I didn't think there was any controversy with that. Um, until I started fellowshipping years later, once I, I finally did start getting involved um, in a small group that, that you could call a church, a group of brothers and sisters, um, I started to run into this idea of free will salvation, that that salvation is offered to everybody and we can choose whether or not to accept it. And this idea was so foreign to me. It was so foreign to my experience. It was so foreign to what I was reading in scriptures. Um, that I would get very frustrated, and I spent years in debate with uh, with this group of brothers that I, that I'd come into, um, trying to persuade them that no, this is wrong. You, you you can't just choose to be saved. You're dead. You're lost. You're damned. There is no choice. You you, you don't have. You there's an unawareness of an of a need for lost people. They don't even know that they need a savior. There's a there's a blindness, a hardness. The Bible says we're dead in trespasses and sins. Dead people can't do anything. Dead people can't choose. We're all damned already. We're all dead. There's nothing in us that can choose. And so, um, and then because of that controversy, when I ran into people who believed the opposite of that, who believed that, that men are capable uh, of choosing whether or not that the gospel is like an offer that's put out there, um, that God doesn't choose individuals. It's up to us to choose God. There's an offer, and everybody decides whether or not they want that offer, and 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 like that's the opposite of what scriptures say. That implies that people have ability, that the people that see that offer have the ability to see it, the ability to desire it, and the ability ability to choose it, and that's a foreign concept. And so, um, I it, like I say, this set about years of, of debate where I would try to persuade people, look, you're wrong, and this steals from the glory of God. This idea that you made the final decision makes you God, in a sense. It steals some of the glory from God and gives the glory to you. You were the ultimate say in whether or not you were saved. And and so I saw this as a great offense to the glory of God. And and it stirred up a passion in me and a zeal. And um, so, but after, after debating with these brothers, I thought to myself, well, if I'm the only one believing this, because I was outnumbered in, in, in my group of fellowship, um, there were other brothers who believed like I do. They just wouldn't articulate it like I did, and they, they wouldn't stand for it like I did. It was just kind of a side issue. For me, this was a de predominant, most important issue because the glory of God was at stake. Either he did it all or I did some part of it, and therefore some glory goes to me. And so, like, this was so offensive to me. And, but then I started thinking, like, if I'm the only one, then obviously I'm wrong. Uh, so this said about, like, I decided, all right, I need to look into church history and see, does anybody else teach this? And, of course, you know, that's when everything explodes. That's when you find um, Augustus and Martin Luther and John Calvin and, and uh, George Whitefield and Jonathan Edwards and, and John Knox and, and um, Charles Spurgeon and, and R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur and John Piper. Um, you just find all these great uh, teachers of the scriptures throughout all of history all the great names teach the same subject and in fact I found it had been classified into a systematic idea um, I, I, th I don't think I discovered it as Calvinism first I think I discovered it as tulip um, which then of course leads right to um, Calvinism so I decided I, I found this has been um, summarized in an acronym called tulip and then um, that tulip acronym 
is identified as what's nicknamed Calvinism, this system of theology called Calvinism, as opposed to this free will ideology called Arminianism. And, and they're in opposition to each other in the church. And, and so with the Arminianism, Arminianism camp, you would have people like uh, John Wesley, um, he's, the, he's the biggest one, and then I think he, he, you'd have to put people like Billy Graham and, and Billy Sunday, I think. Well, I don't know about Billy Sunday, so I shouldn't say that, but um, you'd have to put uh, some of these, these um, other, um, those are really the only two big names that I can think of in that camp. And then you have a whole host of, of current teaching and an ideology that permeates much of the church today. Uh, so spoken from a lot of pulpits by, by lesser known pastors that are in this camp. So, but anyways, I discovered this whole argument, this whole ideology and, and started really digging into it and studying out and found man, like uh, I think Piper was probably the first one I discovered and, and just looking at his, listening to his sermons on Romans and hearing him teach. And I got so excited and fell so in love with him because I was like, this guy's preaching the exact same message that I'm preaching. He's, he's reading in his scriptures the same thing I'm reading. And that just confirmed to me, it's like, how can two people who don't know each other, who have no back, who have no communication, how could we come to the same idea unless this is really what the scriptures are teaching? And then you find all these other giants of the faith believing the same thing. It's like, this is the truth. This is what the church the, the real saints of old, all the, all, the, all the great preachers of the past have believed this. Um, so um, it really just confirmed it and it became a, a, a dominant issue in my life where I wrote many, many articles as I was studying this out. And um, so this is probably one of the last articles I wrote on the topic because it's from March 10th, 2017. Um, I probably started this journey like way back in 2010. Um, but I titled this Is Faith a Choice because the idea is that um, if Arminianism were true and the gospel is just a message that's put out and then each individual in the world has to make a choice on whether or not they believe that, that implies that faith, which is what saves us, faith in that message, is something that in, indwells everybody, that everybody has faith that's just not activated and all you have to do is activate it through your will you have to choose i want to believe this i'm going to believe this so that's the idea of free will uh, arminianism that the gospel message is presented and then you draw upon something that already exists within you the ability to believe faith you you decide whether or not you're going to believe in that um so but that's the opposite of what i read in the scriptures um, so uh, that's why I wrote this article. Is faith a choice? Is it, it is faith an innate ability that exists within everybody that you can then choose by your own will and determination whether or not you're going to put your faith in this message, whether or not you're going to put your existing belief into this system. Um, so that's why this is an important article to look at. Um, but as always, if, if you can't watch this, um, well, it's not live. If you can't watch this in full, um, sub subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can watch this in all my videos at your convenience. Uh, it's King Ram 417. That's K, my middle initial, Ingram, my last name, 417. I'm also going to start posting these videos on Rumble um, just as a precautionary measure in case uh, we get banned off of Facebook and YouTube and all that. There, there's alternative methods that are out there. Um, so, and it's the same thing on Rumble, King Ram 417. Um, so find me on either or, subscribe, and I'll, I'll get these posted on there as soon as possible. And as long as uh, social media is still allowing it, you know, I'll, I'll post it on uh, Facebook, and um, uh, I'm posting on MeWe as well, so you can find me on MeWe. Um, not sure what my um, address is on there, just Joshua Ingram. Um, I've got a picture, so I know they have a lot of little, people use those little icons, but mine's my picture. Um, so if you go on to MeWe and just type in Joshua Ingram, uh, you should be able to find me on there. But um, anyways, uh, before jumping into this article, um, I do want to pray. So if you guys want to pray with me, I'd appreciate it. Oh, Lord. 
as always with these videos I ask for great um, humility that you soften and lower my heart lower idea of self that you abase me Lord that that um, I'm, I'm so often tempted to glory in self Lord to to take credit or to show off and um, it is a wicked sin that dishonors your name and steals from your glory and and prevents uh, ministry from having the effect that it should it taints everything that that selfish pride that that makes it about individual rather than about you it just it ruins it Lord and so I pray that you would remove me Lord that this would be about you that that you would take me out of the picture that that people wouldn't even see me on these videos that um, if necessary it would even be blacked out I, I don't know if people would just listen to an audio or not but that um, that it would just be about you Lord that you would be glorified that you would be honored that people would look to you Lord that they would look um, beyond the messenger that they would just see your glory in every truth that is spoken in, in every scripture that is spoken Lord whatever's true whatever's good whatever's holy whatever comes from you let people see it and receive it Lord open hearts open eyes uh, let them see Lord the, the glory that's in your sovereignty uh, the majesty this isn't just an intellectual debate the issues of sovereignty and and, and uh, Calvinism Lord the doctrines of grace it's not about um, academic arguments it's about your glory your glory is at stake there's beauty in these doctrines there's amazing uh, it's just glorious Lord to, to see you as all-powerful to see you um, as as fully Savior to see ourselves as 100% completely dependent on you without any ability in ourselves without any effort there's nothing in us Lord it's all about you and and that's what these doctrines teach and it's so beautiful and so good uh, so I just pray that you would open hearts Lord that people would see that that uh, that you would be made much of that that uh, you would just empower this message this article anything that's not true anything that's of me anything that taints this or takes away from your message Lord that it uh, just be erased from people's memory it go in one ear and out the other um, that uh, that whatever's true sticks and 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 brings people to see you as even more glorious to see you in a in a higher light to see you shine even brighter in their lights in their lives lord so just be with me as i read this article i love you lord in jesus name i pray amen <clears throat> all right so like i say i titled this is faith a choice and I think one of the biggest errors in this free will Arminian type thinking um, is that faith is something that everyone naturally has, that it just exists in individuals and, and they can choose to activate it. Um, what, it's equated uh, to belief. It's, it, faith becomes almost synonymous with the idea of just believe. Um, it's simply deciding to believe or not to believe an idea. Um, everyone chooses, you know, every day whether or not we believe something, whether or not we believe what we hear. And, and so intellectually choosing to believe the truths of the gospel is what people call faith. You know, you, you choose whether or not to believe what you hear on the media. You choose whether or not to believe what you read in a textbook. And so people equate that to the same thing as you hear the gospel and you choose whether or not to believe that and if you believe it that's called faith um, but is that really what saving faith is um, just choosing to intellectually believe what you hear um, even the demons believe you know it says in James James 2 19 um, says thou believest that there is one God thou doest well the devils also believe and tremble so would we say that the devils the demons have believing faith that they have saving faith because they believe in God um, so is belief the same thing 
Um, I don't think that's what faith is. And, and here's why. My, my main text uh, from which I draw, one of the main texts of all the doctrines of grace is Ephesians 2, uh, verses 8 through 9. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So this verse says that faith is a gift. Um, it is given to us. Faith is given. It, it even specifies that this is not of ourselves. Otherwise, we could boast. We could say, I did something. You know, and, and that's that, that's another drawback. So the glory of God is at stake, but it also sets this idea of superiority in a man's heart. If, if, if the gospel is presented to two people and it's up to you to intellectually decide whether or not you're going to believe and you choose to believe, now you're able to look down your nose at the guy who didn't because you chose and he didn't. So you can look down and go, well, you know, you didn't choose. You should have chose. You know, I chose. Why didn't you choose? Uh, faith being by grace where neither one of you were able to do anything and God chose to have mercy on you there's no room for boasting I can't boast I didn't do anything there, there's no distinction between me and that guy God just chose to have mercy um, you know so there's there's no room to boast in that um, if we all had this ability and I just chose to activate it um, then, like I say, I'm, 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 I'm setting myself up above this guy. Even if you don't acknowledge it, it, it internally, subconsciously creates this idea of superiority where you look at people who, are, who don't believe, who aren't saved, and you think, well, all they got to do is choose. You know, Why didn't they choose? So that's setting yourself up as, as somehow superior. You chose. They didn't. <clears throat> but if neither of us had it, had that ability, and God chose to give it to one of us, uh, not for any reason in or of ourselves, there's no boasting. You can't boast. You didn't do anything. So at this point, some would argue uh, that the gift mentioned in Ephesians 2 there is not faith, but the salvation that comes through faith, our own innate faith. So let me explain why I don't believe that to be true. Uh, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In Romans 10, 17, we read that faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. The fact that faith comes implies that it is not pre-existing. It had to come to you. You didn't have it. It wasn't something that existed in you. It's, it's, it's not something you naturally have that just needs to be acted upon. It's a gift that comes through the hearing of the word. So when the word is preached, when the, when the gospel goes forth, when the word of God goes forth, and some believe to salvation and some don't, it, it, it's not a choice that they've made to activate this inborn faith that they have uh, that makes the difference. Um, it's that God has gifted one faith and not the other. Um, he has mercy on whom he will, and he hardens whom he will. Uh, that's Romans 9.15. It says, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. <clears throat> so in, uh, so the, the idea there is that, that uh, when the gospel is presented, um, well, hold on, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, Hebrews 4.2 says for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them but the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it so we see this played out in this verse in hebrews 4 2 the preaching of the word goes forth some believe some don't why some were given faith some heard it without faith so here we read of those who hear the word and they're not saved it's because the hearing is not mixed with the faith, a faith that God chooses to give or to withhold. That's a miraculous thing. That's something that, that God does in his sovereign purposes. You have two individuals, individual A, individual B, 
a, the, the Lord sends a messenger, sends a preacher. He lays it on a preacher's heart, this urgency, this fervency, this desire to preach. God does that too. So God is, is sovereign over that. He inspires this preacher to go preach. He gives the words. The preacher thinks this is the message I want to preach. This is the text I want to bring. That's all given by God. This is all God orchestrating things behind the scenes using means uh, to do so. And that, that message is then preached to two individuals, individual A and individual B. Individual A hears it and there's no effect on his heart. Individual B hears it and, and he's awakened to the reality of the message. He sees his need of a savior. That's, that's God. God has, th through that word, the word has gone to both of them, but the Holy Spirit has moved through the one through the one uh, word being heard and mixed it with faith. He has given the gift of faith. He has caused that man to be born again. He has reactivated his spirit. He has, he has made him a new creation, given him a new heart that can receive that message because we're dead. The, the preacher's preaching to two dead people who don't have the ability to hear or to receive or to understand or to believe. He's preaching to dead bones. But because the Holy Spirit decides to move, he brings with that word the gift of faith to the to individual B and activates his heart, causes him to be born again so that now he's hearing the spiritual words through a new spiritual life and he's able to receive and he sees his desperate need and he clings because the faith has been given to him. So he hears with faith while the other one just hears. There, and that's not anything those individuals did. They were both equally dead and incapable. It's simply that God chose to have mercy upon one and chose to pass over another. Um, in Galatians 3, uh, verses uh, 23 and 25, we get another look at this. It says, uh, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. And then in 25 it says, but after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So here in, in these verses we read of a faith that comes, uh, just like in Romans 10. And it mentions that, uh, it's, it, the, it says, before faith and after faith. So this speaks to the fact that there's a time in your life, in an individual's life, where faith does not exist in an individual. We're not born we're, we're not naturally born with this inactive faith. Uh, we never had it at all. It doesn't exist. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're born in Adam. We're dead. Um, it, it, this faith has to come to us. It has to be gifted to us, not because of anything we've done, but simply because of the mercy of God. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 says, And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. And Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So here again, we see that not all men have faith. And, and Hebrews tells us that, that Jesus is the author of, and finisher of our faith. He's the creator. He has designed it. He's the one who initiates it. It comes from him. Um, in James 2.1, we read, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with respects of person. And then 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. So this is the part that I think is crucial. And this is an interesting thing, and I don't think I've heard many people preach on this. Uh, James shows us that this faith that is given to us is not our own. It's called the faith of Jesus Christ. It is the faith of Jesus. It's not our own faith. It's a faith that's supernatural, that's given to us. It's his faith. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. His faith gifted to us and then proclaimed as our own. It's credited to us. God gives it to us. God takes the faith of Jesus Christ and implants it into your heart so that his faith is now your faith. Um, that's why it says in 2 Timothy 2.13 that even when we, the born again, do not believe, when we have our moments of doubt and struggle, he abideth faithful because he cannot deny himself. 
his faith. It, it, we've been gifted with it, and it brings this eternal life. It's a supernatural faith that cannot fail. He'll never stop having faith in himself. It is his faith. So even when we struggle, we've been gifted with this internal supernatural faith that preserves us and keeps us. It is his faith accredited to our account. Um, he'll never stop uh, working in us. Uh, he'll never stop working that out in us and through us. <clears throat> In Second uh, Peter one one, it reads: Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And in Jude one three, it says: Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So Second Peter says that we've obtained faith. We've we've gotten it. It's been we've we've um, achieved it. We've we have we have we have captured it. Uh, and Jude says it was delivered to us. So this is not something that pre exists in people. So in conclusion, faith is not some innate ability uh, to believe that exists in all of us, uh, simply requiring us to activate it through voluntary acts of the will. It does not exist in dead children of Adam. We're all born dead in Adam. We don't have the ability. We don't have faith which is required um, for salvation. It doesn't exist in us. We don't have the ability to get it. We're dead. We don't have ears to hear. We don't have hearts of flesh. We don't have the ability to see. The words that Jesus speaks are spiritual, and we don't have spiritual life. It's 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 a dead word to us. It's it's there's no power in it um, until God chooses to activate it by giving you the gift of faith, in which He reactivates your spiritual life. He causes you to be born again. He He gives you ears to hear and eyes to see he grants understanding um and and in that 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 gift he brings that supernatural gift the faith of jesus christ his faith is imparted into your heart so that now you have faith in the gospel the same faith that jesus christ has a knowing absolute faith his faith in god his faith in the gospel his faith in his word his faith in himself has been implanted into your heart so that now you're immovable unshakable preserved forever until the lord comes to get us um sealed with the holy spirit born again able to receive and it comes through the preaching of the word so we preach the word to everybody and when god chooses to deliver that gift of faith through that word to an individual they're miraculously saved and it has nothing to do with the individual everybody is equally dead we, we, we look at the world and it's a graveyard what can dead people do they can't hear they can't see they can't choose and, but we preach, we preach, we preach, because we never know when the Holy Spirit is going to move through that word and activate um, and, and a, a heart, implant the supernatural faith of Jesus Christ into that heart and cause them to be born again, cause them to live, cause them to hear, cause them to believe. Um, <clears throat> so that's what this is. It's the saving faith of Jesus Christ. It's supernaturally imparted to some of us as a conditionless gift. Uh, there's nothing we need to do. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There's no. It's just a gift. God has chosen to have mercy on some. Uh, and it's given through the hearing of the word to those whom he chooses to give. Um, and, and he doesn't give it to all. That's just the reality of this. That he has vessels chosen from before the foundation of the world. That he's chosen to reveal himself to some. And some he's going to pass over and leave. Um, but that's not, there's no, there's no, there's nothing in you that makes you better than the next. You're all equally dead. So we can't boast and say, oh, God chose me. No, there's nothing in you that deserves it. God, God chose between two dead people and, and he chose to have mercy on one and not on the other. Not, there's nothing in you that deserved it. You can't ever look down your nose and you can't ever just assume that a person's lost. We don't know. You can't see the distinction. Uh, between who God has chosen and who he hasn't. We all look the same. So we preach the gospel to everybody. 
and and knowing that it, when God chooses, it's it, unstoppable, immovable. It's, it can't be thwarted. It will accomplish its purposes. It will bring that person to salvation. And if he chooses to pass over another one, we preach to him till they breathe their dying breath. Because some, it, it's it's a timing thing too. God in His timing. Paul grew up under the gospel, heard the message all the time, and had no effect until the road of Damascus. Um, you know, there there was words spoken in my life previous to me getting saved that had no effect. Um, until the day, you know, I don't even remember hearing any scriptures, but, you know, I know I heard the name Jesus before, and I know I, I, know I was familiar with the Bible, um, not like f familiar with the idea of the Bible. So obviously word had been, everybody's heard some word pretty much, you know, and, and people are brought up in the church and hear the gospel all the time. It has no effect. And then one day, it's when the Lord chooses to have uh, mercy, and, and we don't know. So until a person breathes their last breath, we keep preaching. We keep presenting that gospel. We keep throwing out there. We just keep throwing that line in the hopes that, that the Lord will move through it one day and activate. You know, bring that gift of faith into an individual. Um, and he does that all the time. He's, he's sovereign over salvation. Um, this, is, this is his work. He chooses and cho to whom to uh, give mercy to and whom to pass over. He has vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath. And he has holy and wise purposes for doing this. He's a God of love. He knows what he's doing. We have to trust him. We have to trust that he knows why he passes some over and why he doesn't. He's got Esau's and he's got Jacob's. And we just trust that he knows what he's doing. He's a good God. He has a holy and righteous purpose in this. But we don't know who's who, so we preach to everybody. Um, anyways, um, I'll wrap up there. That, that's what I got um, for this message. As always, if, you, if you're just catching the end of it, you weren't able to watch the whole thing, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel or my Rumble channel. Uh, it's KingRam417, K, my middle initial, uh, Ingram, my last name, 417. Um, I'll try to get these posted uh, right, or I always try to get these posted right after I'm done. Um, so you should be able to catch it on there and you can watch all my videos at your convenience. Um, I do other things besides just these teaching uh, videos. I do a Through the Word series where we just kind of go verse by verse through script, some of my favorite scriptures. I do a, uh, a fun reaction uh, videos. And then um, I, uh, I've been posting my podcast on, on there as well. So um, you can check out all these things whenever you want. Um, as always, I appreciate you guys watching. I love you. We'll talk to you next time.